I want to thank the Test of Time Awards Committee for selecting Hog Wild. This project was unbelievably fun and rewarding, and it's a privilege to share the high-level story of this work with you. This was an odd collaboration for today. Three faculty and one student. Steve Wright, Ben Recht, and I were all on the faculty at the University of Wisconsin-Madison at the time. Since then, Ben moved to Berkeley and I moved to Stanford. The intrepid student on the paper was my first PhD student, Fung. Fung and I would later go on to start a company together and build products at Apple. In 2011, the television and machine learning world were all about speed. It was a primitive era. At the time, we were all cooking up frameworks in our own bedroom. There was nothing as standard as PyTorch or TensorFlow, and so we, like many others, were writing our machine learning frameworks from scratch. At the time, the conventional wisdom from most systems folks was that MapReduce was the answer for machine learning. We were building applications, and this didn't obviously ring true to us. Our application was building a system to extract triples from the web. I even found that the demo video is still online at YouTube. In any case, we bought a big machine to speed up SGD on our model. We were very excited, but when we fired up the machine, our model didn't go any faster. We went and implemented everything we could find in the literature. We scoured classical textbooks, yet nothing seemed to move the needle for our problem. So what was going on? Let me show you with an animation. Suppose you have four jobs and two processors. If those four jobs are independent, they don't share any data, then you can use both cores and you go twice as fast. Extending this to more cores would give you linear speed up, the gold standard. If those two cores need to communicate, that is they share data, then you need to run a locking protocol. In this case, that locking protocol could take hundreds of cycles. Worse, communication scales roughly quadratically. If it takes one second for two cores to communicate, then it will take four cores, four seconds to communicate, eight cores take 16 seconds, and so on. We were worried about cases of servers that had 100 or more cores. So communication due to locking was going to be a major challenge for us. In our problem, stochastic gradient descent, or SGD, consisted of billions of tiny little jobs. As a result, implementing it in a classical way led to a situation in which SGD actually gets slower with more cores. So what could we do? We tried many things, but bluntly, we were pretty frustrated. Then one day, Fung came into my office, and he announced, it's going faster. I was incredibly excited. I told him, hey, let's go get some coffee. Tell me what you found out. At this point, Fung got a touch sheepish, and he said, I commented out all the locks. I was stunned. You did what? Now, to a simple computer scientist like me, this was heresy. We taught people locking protocols to avoid dangerous, incorrect values. But I couldn't get too high and mighty, as Fung's approach seemed to be getting the right answer. So this is what we proposed to investigate. Effectively, the locking protocol was non-existent. Just let the cores race. Now note that this may lead to values that would never occur in any serial execution. So the key question was, would this converge at all, and how fast? So Fung and I went down the hall, and we asked Ben, have you seen anything that could explain this? And Ben said he may have recently had a very interesting conversation. Ben said he knew a dude who had been interested in asynchrony since at least the 1980s. Note it wasn't the dude, but it was Big Lebowski trivia legend and optimization god, Steve Wright. As it happened, Steve had been inspired a couple of years earlier by a paper he read and sent Ben a note about. Steve had read of this amazing paper by Nemirovsky, Juditsky, Lan, and Shapiro. The paper appeared in Siam Optimization in 2009 and had reintroduced stochastic approximation, also known as SGD, to the wider optimization community. In 2009 and 2010, Steve had extended their analysis to an asynchronous setting with delayed updates. However, Steve couldn't find a setting where he was satisfied with the results, and so he put them in a drawer. But Steve was intrigued enough that he had sent his notes to Ben. Ben, inspired by this communication, realized something powerful in 2011. The magic of Twitter. 
Ben is an amazing follower on Twitter, and he would go on to be a powerful voice in machine learning. Ben also made a less profound realization in 2011. Sparsity was a key missing ingredient. By adding the secret sauce of sparsity to Steve's analysis, he could get faster expected convergence rates and explain some of what we were seeing in experiments. We highlight three important cases in the paper where sparsity actually holds. So at this stage, like Mary Berry in the original British baking show in 2011, we had all the ingredients. So here's the setup. We assume that the objective is a finite sum of components that each depend on just a subset of the components of the unknown vector x. This subset is typically small and is denoted by bracket i for the ith term in the sum. We assume that all processors have access to shared memory containing a single copy of x. All the processors run loops of three instructions. Pick a random index i. Read the components of x that we need to evaluate the gradient of f sub i then write updates to those components of x by moving along a step length gamma in the negative gradient direction. That's it. There's no locking or coordination. Moreover, it's almost certain that by the time the updates are written back into shared memory, they are stale in the sense that the gradient was evaluated in an outdated value of x. So it's not clear at all that this should work. So does it? So yes, you can go hog wild empirically. Here are some numbers on a few standard data sets at the time. It got the right answer on all of them. We noticed that it worked on sparse applications, but also intriguingly on dense applications. Combining those ingredients that I mentioned earlier, we established a couple of things in this paper. First, we showed that Hogwild would converge with realistic, constant step sizes. Our initial analysis used sparsity and convexity, but it has since been extended to work on some non-convex problems. Also, several papers found other, less restrictive conditions under which speedup could be achieved. Essentially, we showed that as long as the number of processors p is small with respect to the dimension of the problem n, then the convergence rate would only be a constant factor worse. Although the updates were a constant factor slower, there were p operations taking place each time step. That is, a time step was potentially p times faster. Said in the language of parallel processing, Hogwild was getting nearly linear speedups in these cases, which is the holy grail. We also proved some results about an epoch-wise strategy in which the step length was decreased between epochs. This was more robust in the sense of not relying on knowledge of the function parameters and advanced the state of the art even in the serial case. So what happened next? Well, things took a turn. Big companies started using machine learning and making money with it. As a result, scaling up stochastic gradient descent moved to the forefront of researcher and industrial minds. One of my favorite big company applications was from Microsoft, and I'll always love them due to this article. In 2014 or so, Google made a lot of noise about recognizing cats. Not to be outdone, Microsoft built their system to recognize dog breeds. As you can maybe see here, that Microsoft phone is recognizing that the dog is a Shih Tzu. A little bit more seriously, Many large companies have something similar for a range of different systems in image recognition, NLP, voice, search, and more. They were all building large custom machine learning and deep learning stacks. Now, the reason that I'll love the Microsoft article forever is the following quote in that article. It said they were, quote, using a technology called, of all things, hog wild. This line made my heart sing for two reasons. First, the author was absolutely incredulous that a serious company would use such a ridiculously named thing as hog wild. Even more importantly, she got the exclamation point correct, which I had fought hard for when we were writing the paper. Now for me, this project was a huge turning point in my career. Steve and Ben patiently mentored me on optimization and still answer my questions to this day. I was a weird half theoretician, half systems person, and they taught me how to do math that was interesting for optimization and machine learning. I owe them a great deal. The key larger idea that Hog Wild was part of was hugely impactful for me. The idea that relaxing consistency to be architecturally aware could lead to huge performance gains is something that I'm obsessed with to this day. Many others have since written papers about how this idea informed lossy communication strategies, compression and precision trade-offs, and much more. This idea was not ours alone, and it was really a privilege to contribute to it.
The result personally convinced me that systems need to change at every level of the stack to support machine learning, from the hardware all the way up to the software. And this is something that I've been obsessed with for nearly a decade. The love affair of optimization and machine learning was well underway in 2011. There have been optimization workshops at NeurIPS, ML sessions at the big optimization conferences, and Steve had even edited a book, Optimization and Machine Learning, along with others that contained terrific contributions from the experts. Our paper was probably at the leading edge of renewed interest in parallel implementations of the basic optimization methods used in machine learning, especially SGD and its variants, and coordinate descent. There's been a ton of work since then, including by our groups and many others, with extensions in many directions, non-convexity, other parallel models, and the field remains very, very active and vibrant today. Now, the most important thing in any research project is a set of people involved. The folks on this slide were the students and postdocs who took chances on the area of systems meets machine learning in our labs, in large part because of this paper. I want to thank all the students and postdocs who contributed to this line of work, and they've done absolutely amazing work in this space over the past few years. This paper combined three different communities, machine learning, optimization, and systems. I recall attending this conference very fondly. People walked through technical details together and worked to understand each other's ideas. It was my first NeurIPS, and I was instantly attracted to the field and felt welcomed in a way that I hadn't in many other fields. If we're allowed to send one message to the field, it would be this. Please keep this spirit. Please stay generous and curious about understanding each other's ideas. Machine learning is a fascinating area in part because it's a melting pot. Thank you for your time and attention.